Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador's COVID-19 update for today, Wednesday, May the 5th. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Fitzgerald for the latest update. <coughs> Dr. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Since media advisory yesterday, we have six new confirmed cases in our province. Three are in Eastern, and they're all related to travel. Two are between 20 and 39, and third is between uh, 40 and 49, sorry. Two are in Western Health. Both are between the ages of 50 and 59. One is related to travel, and one is uh, contact of a previous case. And one is in Central Health, and the individual is between the ages of 40 and 49, and is contact of a previous case. The total number of cases in our province is 1,114. <clears throat> there have been four new recoveries, and we now have 58 active cases in the province. Two people are in hospital due to COVID-19, and a total of 130, 137 people have been tested to date. Our active case count continues to grow, primarily due to travel into the province and close contacts of those travelers. In the 42 cases reported in the past week, 39 are related to travel and three are close contacts. For the, thankfully, there has been no indication of onward spread of COVID-19 outside of affected households. This tells us that returning travelers and their families are doing the right things by adhering to self-isolation and testing requirements. <clears throat> that being said, the epidemi epidemiology outside of our province remains grim and our risk of an outbreak is still very high. Importation of the virus through travel is our main concern at this time, and our public health team's focus right now is primarily on travel, both in terms of surveillance and containment of new cases. Yesterday marked the one-year anniversary since provincial travel restrictions came into effect. These restrictions are one of the main reasons that we have been able to keep our COVID numbers low and preserve capacity in our healthcare system. But remember that travel restrictions are just one of our layers of protection. It is a safeguard, but not a guarantee. And the safest strategy is to assume COVID is everywhere and act accordingly. We all have to do our part. So keep your non-essential contacts to your steady 20. Do not hold an informal gathering, bringing together people who are not in each other's close contacts. Even if it is less than 20 people, we drive up the number of contacts for each person and increases the risk of spread. If you do hold a gathering, ensure there's enough space for everyone to distance and do not have trays of food for people to serve themselves. You should not hug or shake hands with anyone who's not in your steady 20. And if you received your first dose of vaccine, you must still adhere to the public health recommendations at this time. Do not assume that COVID is not here. <clears throat> your actions should be guided by public health recommendations and not your own personal sense of security or risk. Every decision we make has an impact on others and a ripple effect in our communities. There is no doubt that vaccines are an important part of seeing our way out of this pandemic. To date, we have administered over 185,000 doses of vaccine, an increase of almost 20,000 since last week. Starting today, all regional health authorities will issue an open call for the remaining groups in phase two, including essential workers such as teachers. We anticipate that we will begin offering the vaccine to individuals in phase three, no later than the week of May 24th. Uh, this will include adults 16 and over that were not included in the priority groups for phases one and two. Vaccines will continue to be offered in an age-based approach in accordance with supply uh, as, as the vaccine is received. To find out what priority groups you're being vaccinated in your region and which vaccine is being offered, select the word book on government's homepage, gov.nl.ca. It is welcome news today that Health Canada has approved the Pfizer vaccine for the immunization of children aged 12 and older. <clears throat> children and youth comprise a significant proportion of the population and tend to have more interactions with others through school, social networks, and activities. Immunizing this age group will be an important part of achieving greater community protection and plans are in development to ensure first dose of vaccine before the end of the school year. As a recap, we have six new cases since yesterday's media advisory, and the total number of cases in the province is 1,114. Today is World Hand Hygiene Day. 
Hand hygiene is one of our core public health recommendations to prevent the spread of COVID-19. However, proper hand hygiene is also prevents the spread of other viruses and bacteria, such as those that cause the common cold and the stomach flu. Frequent and effective hand washing should be a lifelong practice for all ages, and this is an excellent opportunity for a refresher on how to properly wash your hands. When using soap and water, wash your hands for 40 to 60 seconds, making sure to rub the entire surface of your hand, including your thumbs. And when using hand sanitizer, it should be approved by Health Canada and contain at least 60% alcohol. You should rub the entire surface of your hands for 20 to 30 seconds until it is dry. Our continued public health efforts, such as hand hygiene, wearing masks, distancing from others, are more important now than ever. We cannot let complacency and, and pandemic fatigue set in. So hold fast, Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. That's a great reminder about hand washing. It's so great to hear about the uptake of vaccines in our province. Getting your COVID-19 vaccination is incredibly important for you, of course, but also for your family, your friends, and for everyone else in your communities. Over 175,000 people in Newfoundland and Labrador have now received their first dose of this important vaccine. Officials at the Department of Health tell me that by Sunday, that number should be over 200,000. Last weekend, we reached a major milestone. More than 80% of people in the province who are over the age of 70 have received at least one dose. Today, we begin vaccinating our teachers you are such a vital part of our communities. Thank you for your tireless efforts. And thank you for your patience as the province's vaccination program continues to roll out. Of course, that continues. And I can't stress enough, when your opportunity comes, please take it. The vaccines approved and being offered in Canada are safe. When my turn comes, I will be getting whatever vaccine is available to me. Again, yesterday, I spent a little time at the airport seeing more than more healthcare workers from this province who are heading up to our neighbors in Ontario. Our second team of nurses and doctors will continue to provide much needed help. Some of them I know very well, my former colleagues and friends, and I was not surprised to see them at the airport and them having raised their hands as numerous people did to offer help. I then thought about every frontline worker and what they've been doing to get us to this point in the pandemic. Near my house, a person has a sign out on their lawn that simply reads, thank you to all frontline workers. It's a nice gesture. So I wanna thank you, all the frontline workers, not just in healthcare, but in our public service. People on the front lines continuing to provide services throughout this pandemic. You work so hard on a daily basis. And in doing so, we will keep you top of our mind. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Haggy for some brief remarks. Dr. Haggy. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. Uh, it is, again, uh, um, a day where we see more active cases and our numbers have not yet begun to decline. Before I go on with my comments, I'd just like to uh, mention two other um, uh, week uh, events that are marked. Uh, firstly, it's Emergency Preparedness Week, and my colleagues in Fire and Emergency Services asked me to remind the public of that. They have some excellent advice on their website. Uh, we've seen all too frequently, unfortunately, the havoc that can be uh, wrought by uh, adverse weather events, particularly. Uh, and going back a year, this, uh, this whole uh, uh, sequence of events started with snowmageddon, and uh, flood events are not unusual. Uh, the other event I'd like to mark is it's International Day of the Midwife. Uh, we have seen great success in the uh, demonstration project in Gander uh, with uh, reproductive health, um, low-risk obstetrics uh, being uh, serviced by midwifery um, and with the possibility of, of home deliveries. Uh, there's also uh, lactation advice uh, and general advice on, on reproductive health and we look to roll out further sites over the course of this next year uh, with um, uh, uh, other midwifery programs to integrate uh, with, um, with obstetrics. Um, as I say, uh, the vaccine rollout continues. 
uh, we should have, uh, as a premier referenced, a significantly uh, greater number of the population vaccinated by the end of this week. We've doubled the number of people having had first dose in the last three weeks uh, in this province. Uh, a major achievement, and our limitation really is simply vaccine arrival. We will see us go to 28,000 doses a week uh, as of next week, uh, rising to 32 and then 34,000 doses a week uh, by June. And as these uh, increases come, uh, so too uh, we, will, uh, we will increase our rate of delivery. Uh, I'm finally eligible for my vaccine now, and I have an appointment booked in Ganda uh, tomorrow evening uh, on my way home. So uh, uh, I too will, uh, will get a chance to join that uh, ever-increasing group. Uh, again, travel is our concern. Uh, we look at figures across Canada. Uh, there are 147 cases per 100,000 on average across Canada. We are at 8.1. And a lot of that has been driven simply by um, the uh, arrival of that ship uh, in Conception Bay, uh, which the federal uh, authorities are, are quarantining. Alberta, one of the uh, places from which we get a lot of our travelers, uh, is up at 311 uh, per 100,000, and that, yeah, that's the highest north of the Mexican border. Uh, so we need to remain vigilant, and by doing so, uh, we will continue to contain those travel cases uh, within the households uh, in which they live. Uh, so with that, Premier, I think I'll uh, hand it back to you uh, for the media. Thank you. Well, thank you, Minister. I'll now invite questions uh, from the media. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, there are six reporters registered for today's call. The question and answer session will be conducted in two rounds, where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up per round. Following this, I will ask each reporter if they have one final question. Our first questions are from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, I just want to make sure I didn't miss here, but looking to have school-age children or those 12 and older vaccinated by the end of this school year, um, so we're looking to move the entire timeline for first vaccinations up completely then? Um, so we're certainly looking at how we're going to operationalize that uh, at the moment with the regional health authorities and uh, uh, you know our hope is that we won't see a difference in the timeline but this is a really important group to get vaccinated um, as we saw with our last outbreak that uh, you know kids in this age group can certainly spread this virus so we want to make sure that we can uh, get them done so that hopefully um, you know by very early in the next school year we can have everybody fully vaccinated in that age group so um, that's our goal, um, and we're working through exactly how that's going to play out. Thank you. And earlier this week, uh, NACI, in terms of AstraZeneca, um, there was some concerning messaging coming from them. Uh, a lot of people now looking at it for them saying that if your COVID risk is low, the AstraZeneca trade-off may not be worth it. That was one of the takeaways made by the NACI chair. Uh, just looking for your stance on this in terms of considering right now we're not deemed a hot spot for people who are contemplating booking AstraZeneca or waiting for Pfizer and Moderna? So at the moment, uh, you're right, we're, our epidemiology is quite favorable. And so, um, you know, when you're looking at uh, booking um, vaccine, you have to look at what's your risk from the vac, you know, with that particular side effect of the vaccine-induced thr uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And what's the risk of becoming quite ill, se severely ill with um, COVID-19? And uh, so that's a balance and a risk. And we offer uh, the AstraZeneca right now in the way that we feel most balances that risk. People are informed uh, and make a uh, you know an informed consent to have that vaccine when they do, and they understand the risks. So we feel that where we are right now is is where we need to be. The vaccine is deemed to be a safe vaccine uh, by Health Canada. Um, and, uh, you know, as with anything, there is nothing in this life that's without risk. So uh, it's really about um, looking at the risk versus the benefits and making an informed choice. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson with The Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, as a follow-up to Kellyanne, Dr. Fitzgerald, 
Um, what do you make of the chair of the uh, National Committee saying on television that she could never live with herself if she advised her sister to get AstraZeneca and her sister died of thrombosis? Okay, thank you. Um, so, Peter, I don't think it's really appropriate for me to comment on what somebody else said. Um, you know, they were asked a question, they answered it. I don't know the context of that question, so I don't think I'm going to make any comment on that. Uh, are you concerned, uh, given the fact that the National Committee uh, uh, heads uh, have expressed um, these concerns about AstraZeneca, are you concerned that you might have further hesitation in your Further evidence of what? Sorry, Peter? You, you drifted off there at the end, Peter. Sorry. Are you concerned about further hesitancy uh, on AstraZeneca given the public statement of the uh, NASA uh, official? Um, certainly, you know, that is, it's always a concern. Whenever, uh, whenever we have um, concerns about vaccines, whether it be side effects or whatever the case may be, you know, you always worry about vaccine hesitancy. Um, what I would say is that these vaccines have been approved. They are safe. Um, they have made recommendations with regard to uh, prevalence. NACI is our national advisory committee. They don't produce policy. Um, and that's why they have given that, uh, uh, that uh, laxity in the statement with regard to uh, you know, looking at the prevalence and, and, and informing the policy based on that. So, uh, you know, there is, there's certainly, um, I think, very good evidence to use AstraZeneca uh, in our country right now, um, especially given what we're seeing elsewhere. And, uh, you know, I personally am not, um, would not be hesitant to get the vaccine. Um, and, uh, but, you know, as I've said before, everybody has to make an informed cho choice, and uh, that has to be for them. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC. Please go ahead. Dr. Fitzgerald, you said today that the risk uh, of an outbreak has never been higher. Uh, why are we not bringing in additional border measures, whether it be uh, hotel quarantines like New Brunswick or additional testing? like PEI in order to reduce that risk? Um, so we are both looking at both of those options. As I said last week, we want to make sure we get it right. We have to make sure that, you know, within its, uh, within uh, the least restrictive uh, measures to use according to our uh, legislation. And, um, and so we want to make sure we're getting that just right and make sure we have the capacity for that uh, program to roll out properly. So, uh, you know, expect some news, I think, in the coming days, but uh, we're just not quite there yet. There is a lot of anxiety, uh, a lot of discussion of people feeling that a third wave is almost uh, inevitable. I, I, Dr. Fitzgerald and uh, Minister Hagee, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. Do you think it's inevitable? And what do you think the key factors will be dis that decide whether it does, in fact, happen? Um, so I don't think it's inevitable. I think we will see cases. I think we will continue to see cases, and we'll probably see more cases over the coming weeks. Um, but I think how people... Uh, adhere to public health measures, uh, that will certainly um, make the difference as to whether or not we see a wave out of this. You know, what we have to remember is that we do have um, some strict travel uh, restrictions to come into the province. We have strict quarantine restrictions. We have testing for those people who are our most frequent travelers coming into the province, so rotational workers, essential workers, uh, people who have to uh, essential workers who have to go to work, and then as well, you know, rotational workers who are doing this over and over again and need to spend time with their families. So we're trying to reduce the risk of that spread that's uh, as much as possible. So uh, with the testing measures that we have in place. So we've certainly put in some really good measures to help reduce the risk of importation. However, as I've said many times before, our, these are just layers of protection. So. Uh, there's always the chance that the holes in the Swiss cheese can line up so that a case can get through. And, uh, you know, what we have to do then is to make sure that if a case does get through, it doesn't get very far. And the best way to do that is to keep your contacts low, maintain your physical distancing, wear your masks when you're out in public, um, you know, and just really be conscientious of reducing your COVID, your own personal COVID risks. So that's what we have to do. Minister? Thank you very much, Premier. I, I mean, I think uh, 
uh, Dr. Fitzgerald's comments in those three or four sentences have been a master class on uh, public health and, and managing of uh, epidemics. Uh, and it's worked. I think the, the important thing is that we are seeing more cases. Uh, we are picking up more cases. And those cases are remaining confined to a household if there's any contact spread at all. We've seen a 50% jump in arrivals by air at uh, St. John's. Uh, and across the province. We know that the camps in Alberta and Northern Ontario are reducing to skeleton staff or warm idle, whatever they call it. Uh, and we also know that this is a time of the year when students come home and uh, snowbirds, people ordinarily resident with the right of residence in Newfoundland and Labrador would also come home. Uh, and with them, with that movement comes the virus. But as long as people read the rules, read the guidelines and follow them, then we are uh, uh, an example of defense in depth. And I would argue that Dr. Fitzgerald has just layered those out for you uh, in some detail. And we have, I think, between our approaches uh, on the travel piece and on the quarantine piece, the most comprehensive, consistent and cohesive way of dealing with travel importation. And I will add on that too, if I can, that you know we got to consider that vaccines are coming in here too. So um, as long as people continue to step up and get vaccinated, that's going to help us out. Every person who gets vaccinated is a help. So um, certainly, um, I would encourage everyone to uh, do that when it's your turn. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with BOCM. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, going back to the news from Pfizer earlier today about uh, adolescents being able now to receive the Pfizer vaccine, uh, this is a fairly large group of people to vaccinate that have previously not been factored into our rollout plan. Uh, do we anticipate that this could result in any sort of a, a pushback in our target, date, target dates, given now that we have this uh, large group to factor in? Thank you very much, Richard. The number that we think we're dealing with is somewhere just over around 30,000 uh, if you factor in the additional uh, age 12 to 15 inclusive. That is an increase in the eligible population uh, and it amounts to currently a week of Pfizer deliveries. Uh, so we will do our best to make that up. We are expecting extra Pfizer uh, and we certainly are seeing increased amounts. So exactly how that will pan out over time will depend on uh, the Pfizer delivery schedule, but also depends on whether our estimates of uptake for the general population uh, are accurate and how many of those have already been captured through groups like essential workers, through groups like teachers, uh, and through the categories in phase two, because our numbers are approximate in those groups, and thus far, we have not found ourselves running shy of vaccine because of the way we've estimated those numbers. But the, the, the final uh, addition will come towards the end of June. Thank you, and I, I know that the uh, formal plans are still being, uh, still being worked on, but um, in your estimation, what could we potentially see this rollout look like for the 12 to 15 year olds? For example, will we see uh, mass vaccination set up in schools? Um, how, how do we foresee this looking? Um, yeah, so we've just started having uh, conversations uh, with the RHAs about that. And uh, so right now it is still very much uh, in, the, in the early planning stages. So uh, I wouldn't want to talk at a turn, but uh, you know, the options are uh, basically that it gets administered through mass vaccination clinics versus going into schools. And there may have to be some combination of that. Um, it's, uh, it's still, but once we have the plans, it's still up in the, it, I, don't know, I don't want to say up in the air, but it's still, it's still uh, in the planning process. So once we are, are firm on how we're going to do that, then we'll be certainly, certainly letting people know. Thank you. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler with Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hi there. Could you provide an update on the federal Montreal in Exception Bay and the conditions on board uh, at this time? Um, my understanding at the moment is that uh, everyone who's on board are doing okay. 
um, and uh, they have, uh, you know, the information that's been out there already is uh, 13 cases on board. Um, everybody is uh, isolating property and uh, um, Eastern Health is back out today doing more testing. So. And uh, elsewhere in Atlantic Canada, Prince Edward Island has announced that uh, as of May 17th, pharmacies are going to start to be involved with uh, vaccine rollout. Um, can you tell us about the plans for using, vac uh, using pharmacies and how, um, I, I guess, the delivery of vaccines might change when we get to, to uh, phase three later in May? Sure, Chris from Fitzpatrick. Um, yes, no, that's a, a really good question. Um, May 24th week, excuse me, is likely the week we would do the open call for phase three. Uh, that is the, uh, the time when we would see uh, distributing vaccines to pharmacies to simply to get them out into areas where maybe the RHAs might be a challenge to hold uh, clinics. The other uh, piece uh, is that uh, Pfizer have also altered their storage recommendations in terms of temperature around their mRNA vaccine uh, to mean that it, we've got a little bit more wiggle room there for 30 days or so uh, after it's actually thawed. So we would engage with uh, other providers of vaccine around phase three start. We anticipate under uh, ideal circumstances, given the schedule that we've got from Pfizer, which has been very reliable lately, uh, it would be the week of May 2-4. Our next questions are from Sarah Smelly with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, we're used to, to having active case numbers between zero and five. What is the story behind our caseload right now? Like, do we have more travelers coming in or are we kind of a window into the higher numbers and transmission in the rest of the country? I think it's rather the later, but I'll pass it over to uh, the latter, sorry, yeah. pass it over to Dr. Fitzgerald. So I think uh, certainly, I mean, there is a gradual rise in travelers coming to the province. That happens every year, this time of year. Uh, so there is that, but uh, I think it's just a factor of what's happening everywhere else. Uh, we're seeing, you know, uh, a lot of our travel comes from Alberta. We're seeing huge rates in Alberta. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, uh, it's inevitable that uh, when people come back from these places that have really high incidence, um, that we're going to see more cases after they get home. And, and when you watch the situation in, in the rest of the country, are there specific things you're, you're looking for? What do you keep your eyes on? Uh, we certainly look at, uh, we look at rates of disease. We also look at trends in how that's going. Is it going down? Is it going up? And there are some provinces that are making some great uh, strides in, in reducing their rates. Quebec is doing quite well over the last several weeks. Uh, on the whole, there does appear to be a decrease in, um, in the country as a whole with no regard to case counts. Uh, we also look at uh, what uh, provinces are doing with regard to trying to curb some of those um, numbers. So are they putting in restrictions? Are they not? Uh, you know, so there are, there's a, a fair bit of uh, um, information that our epidemiologists look at when we're, when we're looking at uh, the rest of the country to decide where we, uh, where we go with things. Um, so uh, at the moment, you know, everywhere is, is kind of the same uh, beyond the Atlantic provinces. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we, we're quite uh, concerned about importation from those areas. Thank you. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you. Dr. Fitzgerald, you said we're looking a bit closer at our borders here now in terms of potentially doing uh, hotel quarantines and things like that. Are we looking at um, travelers requiring a negative test before entering the province as international travelers have to do entering the country? Um, so that's a bit difficult to do because, uh, you know, there are lots of travelers who have to be allowed, uh, to come home. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult, uh, that would be a very difficult thing to put into place. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're looking at how we can use testing to best, uh, um, to best reduce uh, the risk of spread, both to households and to the community. So, uh, we're focusing on that right now. 
Right. Um, Premier, in terms of the third wave that we're seeing through other parts of the country, um, you have kind of got an air on the ground in Ontario where we're seeing um, extremely high rates of COVID-19 right now. Uh, what are you hearing about the experiences there from our healthcare workers that are on the ground in emergency rooms and ICUs to give people a, a better picture of, of what's going on there? Yeah, certainly I'm hearing uh, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'll say this, uh, that uh, they've been welcomed with open arms by their colleagues in Ontario, and I think uh, it's welcome help. Um, they're being able to relieve uh, some of the staff on the ground there who are working, uh, you know, seven days a week. Uh, they're at their end uh, and pushing their professional and personal limits. Um, I'm also hearing that the vaccines are, you know, in, in, a, in a positive light, that the vaccines are working. So some of the patients who are elderly who end up in the hospital who have had one or two doses of vaccines just don't don't get sick, as sick. Unfortunately, what is happening is some younger people and families even are uh, are getting quite ill, and um, it's it's fairly shocking, I think, to the to our medical staff uh, who are on the ground and have not had that experience with COVID-19 here. Thank God, in our province. Um, and so th there is this, uh, you know, this flipped, di this flipped dichotomy that didn't exist before and it's the exact opposite of what we were expecting in the, in the first wave, if you will. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's uh, disturbing and frightening, um, but they're, uh, they're working hard. And I think, it, you know, it's, it's equal to Dr. Fitzgerald's point earlier about um, why we're seeing increasing numbers here. And, and, uh, and Dr. Fitzgerald said this uh, with respect to the outbreak we had in February as well, that it's just a, f a sure volume of the young people that are getting COVID-19 as well, that eventually people will end up in, in the ICUs there. But um, that doesn't make it any less uh, troubling and, and, and less difficult uh, for the medical professionals here, or frankly, anywhere, anywhere it doesn't matter where you're from, uh, to have to deal with. So um, they, I would say that it, a common theme that I've heard from them is that it's not being, it's, it's, not, it's being represented well in the media in terms of the impact. Um, and uh, so there's uh, significant volumes of people, but I think a positive sign in some of this is that the, the vaccines are working in the age groups in which they've been able to get into the ARS. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson with The Telegram. Please go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Fitzgerald, uh, given the known perils of teenage gathering, uh, are you on board with the decision of some schools to compress the school day by limiting lunch periods uh, and instead send kids home earlier? Um, <clears throat> so I think, uh, you know, that's a, that was a decision that uh, the school district made to try to uh, address an issue that they were seeing. Um, and uh, we gave our feedback to them. Uh, you know, it, I, it's not really appropriate for me to say if I'm on board with it or not. It's not really a... A public health decision. It was really an operational decision by the uh, by the uh, English school district. So, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, okay. just uh, sorry, Peter, to cut you off there, but uh, perhaps a comment on graduation parties as well. I've been uh, uh, hearing some uh, some questions as we get towards the end of the school year. Not to take a question away from the media, but perhaps if I could uh, get uh, Dr. Fitzgerald to uh, just uh, uh, given the fact that you asked a question about schools, uh, Peter, about graduation parties. Uh, yes, sure. certainly. So, you know, we do have information on our website about gatherings and how gatherings should be organized and what constitutes a safe gathering, what the limits of those gatherings are. Uh, right now, our recommendation is that any informal gathering should be limited to your steady 20. Um, so if people are thinking about informal gatherings, uh, you really need to think closely about that. Um, and uh, if it's going to be organized by, a, by a, you know, a, a business or... Uh, in a facility, then uh, certainly the, the expectation is that those rules will be followed. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I get that graduation is a really important uh, milestone, and, uh, you know, my son graduated from, uni uh, from high school last year and um, wasn't able to have his graduation uh, ceremony or prom. So, uh, you know, I understand the importance of that to people, but we have to do things safely, and, uh, and the guidance is there if uh, people uh, want to refer to it. It's on the website. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess the Premier gets one more question. <laughs> um, uh, actually, I do have one last question for the Minister. That is, uh, can you quantify the increase uh, that the Department or Health Authorities have noticed 
in terms of substance abuse and, uh, abuse and other mental issues since this time last year. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Certainly we do track uh, statistics with regards to uh, substance use, uh, uh, overdoses, and uh, uh, inadvertent uh, deaths from uh, opioid poisoning. I don't have the numbers at my fingertips. I'll uh, go back to the department and get you uh, the, the most recent summary that we do have and send it along to you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. I've heard from uh, quite a few people that it can now take two to three days from the time that you request a COVID test to actually getting your appointment. Um, this seems to be an increase from it used to be about 24 hours or so. So I'm wondering uh, why that is, especially considering our test numbers are still relatively low. And are we concerned that this is going to delay reporting of new cases and therefore allowing uh, contact tracing and isolation? Um, so we were aware of uh, that issue. Uh, it seemed to develop over this weekend. Um, so uh, we have gone back and talked to uh, the RHAs and uh, uh, they've advised us that uh, that uh, problem is now rectified and it should be 24 hours uh, from the time you um, uh, go online or call for a test uh, till you get a call back for your appointment or till you get your uh, testing done, sorry. And with uh, essential workers now being eligible to book, can you give us an idea of exactly what does this list include? Which sort of professions uh, are included in there? And when we talk about teachers, does that include just teachers or everyone who works in schools? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll answer your second first. Uh, it does include everyone who's working in schools, anyone who's coming into contact with kids. Um, and uh, with regard to essential workers, so that what we've said is anyone who's had to who is uh, providing essential services uh, and had um, uh, direct contact with the public during uh, alert level five, so when we were on lockdown. Uh, so those would be people who, uh, I mean, and I certainly, I'm not gonna give an exhaustive list obviously here, but uh, you know, those would be pe people working frontline retail, for example, people working um, in, uh, in pharmacies, um, and uh, anyone who basically had to be in contact with the public um, during uh, lockdown and had to, and couldn't work from home and had to go to work. So that's that's the group that we're targeting. Um, obviously, just in case if we, heaven forbid, have to go into another lockdown, uh, you know that those people are protected when they have to work. So. Thanks. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with BOCM. Please go ahead. Cancer patients are asking provinces to green light a second shot of their uh, two-shot COVID-19 vaccine, according to the manufacturer's schedule. Um, emerging research suggests that uh, many cancer patients have a reduced immune response to the vaccine, so a single COVID-19 shot uh, may leave them insufficiently protected. Are there any plans for Newfoundland and Labrador to have cancer patients receive their second so uh, shot sooner? Um, so at the moment, uh, we're still uh, holding with the uh, t uh, 16 weeks, but uh, certainly, you know, we're always looking at new information that becomes available. Um, there's a difference between what we call a humoral response, so having antibodies and being protected. And, uh, and so the studies that were done initially uh, looked at just antibody production. And, um, and so, you know, as more real world, world data comes out, uh, we certainly, uh, you know, may have to adjust that policy, and we will if we have to, um, but we're certainly still looking at it at this time. And BOCM is hearing that people at the Village Mall Clinic are being registered in the system three or four times. Is this something that you're aware of, and is it interfering with the vaccine rollout? Uh, the short answer to that is no, we weren't aware of it, and no, it's not interfering with vaccine rollout. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler with Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, just a question about uh, vaccines again. Um, the number of total doses administered, I guess the number of people who've gotten the first dose has been steadily increasing, uh, but those with uh, getting their second dose hasn't, um, uh, at least to the same. Uh, my question 
need to give start giving second doses start to catch up with us and, and what contingencies are in place for, for when um, that happens. Yeah, it's all built in, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we know that second doses have to start happening uh, 16 weeks after the first. And uh, so uh, that's been factored in. People are generally, uh, you know, the people who are going to be first in that uh, group are going to be the people from phase one, obviously, who haven't gotten second doses up to this point. So, yeah, you are likely going to see um, a divergence in, in those numbers, that one will keep going up and the other one will only very modestly go up until we hit that 16-week uh, mark, and then we start vaccinating those people who got first doses uh, early, and uh, you'll start to see those uh, fully vaccinated numbers go higher. But that that's completely expected given the... Uh, um, given the strategy that we've taken um, with trying to vaccinate as many people with uh, one dose as we can. And uh, it, uh, it has been factored into the plan, so it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, just as a, an additional comment, every person who goes to a vaccination clinic to get their shot one goes away with a card with a date and time for shot two. Um, and my second question, I guess this is for any of you, um, can you give us the latest on discussions you've had with uh, pr with counterparts in other provinces related to uh, lifting measures related to inter interprovincial travel and, and where those discussions are at right now, when when that could potential, potentially happen? Uh, certainly, that's an active, ongoing discussion, both with the Atlantic premiers and premiers from across the country. <laughs> I think it was a positive uh, sign lost in, in, in the rightfully placed uh, anxiety, uh, the rest of Canada's numbers uh, were, were skyrocketing in the last week or so. Uh, but Dr. Tam released some models towards the summer about the impact uh, of uh, different levels of vaccinations and how that uh, can have an impact on uh, public health measures. Uh, and I think that's something that's a positive sign. Um, and I think uh, that we're, we're anxiously awaiting a refinement of that model. and. I think all premiers are looking at that. I would just speak on behalf of myself and, and looking at that in terms of how that can impact, uh, you know, tourism industries, uh, local industries that have been, you know, uh, at limited capacity. Um, so, I, you know, I think there is a, a degree of optimism in the year, especially as uh, as the vaccines uh, you know, continue to roll out and the supply chain becomes more robust and more available. And I think that it was uh, Dr. Tam's model was a, a significant step forward in and recognizing what could be a very different uh, summer. Our next questions are from Sarah Smelly with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. I'm okay, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I'll now go back, I'll now go back through each reporter to see if you have one final question. Kellyanne Roberts with NTV, do you have a final question? Yes, um, Dr. Fitzgerald or, or really anyone on the panel. Um, looking at herd immunity, it seems like that benchmark continues to move as variants become more predominant through the country. So looking from what I've seen, 80 to 90 percent needed to be vaccinated for herd immunity. And, and while it's not important to necessarily stick on that number, uh, what can you say to the public when we talk about herd immunity and, and that's kind of been the light at the end of the tunnel and that tunnel just seems to be getting longer and longer? I would say first get vaccinated <laughs> first and foremost. We'll go ahead so yes, I mean it, we can only get there if everybody gets vaccinated. But um, you know what we need to think about is that we are going to get to a point where we have a significant proportion of our population vaccinated, fully vaccinated. If if H one N one is any indication um, of how we respond to a uh, pandemic uh, with regard to vaccinations, I think we are in good shape. Um, and. So there's always going to be some people who can't get the vaccine or who don't get the vaccine. And uh, there's always going to be situations where, you know, someone may not respond uh, well to the vaccine. And so uh, we're always going to have uh, situations where COVID may come back in. Um, you know, it's very unlikely that we're going to eradicate COVID with this vaccine at this point. So, uh, you know, we know it can mutate. We know it can change. So uh, we know that variants are going to be an issue. What we, what, the information is telling us now is that, uh, you know, for the variant that we're seeing most prominently in the country, this these vaccines seem to work. Um, that's very promising. So, you know, eventually we're going to learn to live with COVID uh, as we live with uh, other uh, vaccine-preventable diseases, and uh, that's sort of where we're heading. 
Um, but uh, make no mistake that getting your vaccine at this point, um, you know, when it's offered, uh, when you're able to avail of it, is very important to, to get us there. Thank you. Peter Jackson with the Telegram. Do you have a final question? I think you're on mute, Peter. Did we lose Peter? One of the Sorry two about of that. Um, I, yes, I do have another question. That is, I'm looking uh, to see how an essential worker will find out that they are an essential worker. So what happened during the booking? Since you can't possibly uh, delineate everyone. Um, so, certainly when someone goes in and identifies as an essential worker, um, uh, there is a category there to, uh, to click on that. And, uh, you know, it is, I, I think we're relying on people to be honest and to be uh, forthright, and I think most people are. I think people understand the importance of making sure that those frontline essential workers who are unable to work from home um, during Alert Level 5, uh, need to be vaccinated to protect not just themselves, but our whole community um, and our whole province. So uh, it's really important uh, that um, that people uh, understand that. Um, but uh, yeah, we are, you know, I think at this point, uh, um, we our expectation is that people um, will hold true to that recommendation. Peter Cowan with CBC, do you have a final question? I do. We are expecting the federal government will ship Johnson & Johnson doses after they've done their own review. We know that they've received them. How are those going to fit into our vaccination uh, program and our plan? Um, so certainly we're working through how we're going to use Johnson & Johnson. Uh, you know, there are some benefits to it. It's a one-dose vaccine, and so there are some communities, some populations where that would be a very beneficial thing. Um, so uh, we're waiting to see what Health Canada says. Uh, we're looking at uh, the guidance for how to use it. Um, and certainly, um, you know, we can see it being used in uh, situations if we ended up with an increased, um, increased prevalence in certain areas, it may be a very useful, um, a useful vaccine in that situation as well. So, um, you know, we're still working through where exactly it's going to be used. Richard Duggan with VOCM. Do you have a final question? I do, thank you. Um, a bit of a follow-up to the question there about travel between provinces. Um, originally, there was a call by the Premier's Advisory Council on Tourism to have us open for the rest of Canada by July 1st. Uh, given what, what we're seeing in the rest of the country right now, how realistic is that uh, at this time? And what would you say to tourism operators that may be feeling a bit anti right now? Well, I'd, you know, instead of looking at what the puck is now, try to look at where the puck is going to be in July. And I think that uh, to reiterate what I s said previous, um, uh, Dr. Tam's model attempts to do that in terms of different vaccination rates and, and the different uh, efficacy rates of said vaccine. So, um, you know, I think the summer uh, should be a, a very different summer than we had last year. Uh, and, but these are all uh, things that the premiers are discussing. I'm sure these conversations are ongoing at the minister's table and the chief medical officer's tables as well. Um, but uh, as vaccines continue to uh, get in arms, uh, this will uh, continue to work. And we'll, uh, even though we're seeing some evidence now of real life data, uh, seeing uh, how it diminishes the transmission in certain uh, jurisdictions, and all of these are positive signs uh, towards a uh, perhaps not a normal summer by any stretch, but a, a, an improvement on what we saw uh, last summer. Thank you. Patrick Butler with Radio Canada. Do you have a final question? I'm good, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Sarah Smelly with the Canadian Press. Do you have a final question? Yes, just a quick question for the Premier. Is our plan, uh, do we plan to send more teams to Ontario? Uh, it is, right now we're looking at everything and looking at uh, what they need <laughs> and what we have in terms of capacity. Um, so that's uh, those are ongoing discussions uh, right now. I think we're, we're we're still developing those discussions in terms of what we have available in in, in our own within our own capacity. So uh, we'll provide an update if uh, if anything changes. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Premier, do you have any final comments for today? Well, thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, many of you have been asking when things will get back to normal. And uh, believe it or not, despite uh, some anxieties and stress, we are going to eventually get there. In the weeks ahead, our vaccine rates continue to increase and things will continue to improve. But I can't say enough how proud I am of how everybody is continuing to do their part in keeping this province safe. Again, we are the envy of most provinces across the country. Many of them are currently seeing COVID increase in their, in their own local jurisdictions. Our low numbers can be traced back to one thing, your hard work and determination. And on a final note, I usually each week ask that you keep local businesses in mind when making your purchases. So please do what you can to support your local businesses and restaurants. Stay safe, Newfoundland and Labrador. We will get through this.